Well, you can open with me to John chapter 1. This evening, John Snyder from Christ Church in New Albany is here with us. He'll be preaching from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. So I'll read those verses for us. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Well, good afternoon. It's good to be back with you. I want us to look at something uh, together today that I hope will help us all, uh, the believer in particular, as, as we, you know, we labor to find ways to benefit our soul, to grow more like Christ, um, to be a channel of the kindness of God and the realities of God to those around us. Now, there are no Christian life hacks, you know. There are no little um, easy shortcuts where if you just found this or did this, um, you know, then, then by tomorrow morning we would just be so much further along. Christianity is a, a, a long devotion in one direction. There, there is that wonderful quality of, of an enduring walk with the king. But there are things that we can do that can benefit us. Um, you know, and there are just so many. I mean, you, you, can, you can get good books, put them on your shelves, read them. You can, you know, you can take courses online uh, to help you to understand God better. You, you can do so many things. But one of the most beneficial things I've found in my own life as a believer is to labor to get the right measures of Christ. And I have neglected throughout my 53 years quite a lot uh, of topics that are good topics and uh, that, you know, there there is use in them, but I have neglected them for the focus on Him, and I have not regretted it. I want us to consider how we might enlarge our scanty thought of the Lord Jesus Christ Is he everything that we have been told he is? Is he enough? And how do we expand in our own understanding and and in our hearts, how do we expand that little pronoun in the Bible, him, so that every page of Scripture, uh, the benefit that it brings our soul is, is greatly 
enlarged so that, you know, every scene that we read, whether it's Bethlehem or the dusty roads of Galilee or it's Calvary or it's the ascension of Christ and the enthronement at the right hand of the Father or the judgment, all these scenes begin to take their proper dimension before our eyes and, and have an appropriate impact on our lives. How do we cause these realities to impact us the way that they ought to. Well, we want to help ourselves get the right measurements of Christ. Where do you get your measurement of Christ? I know where we're supposed to get our measurement of Christ, but where do you get your measurement of Christ? I would say that for most of us, if we're honest, we tend to get our expectations of Christ and, and you know, our the dimensions in our mind of how great Christ is, we tend to get that from the Christian culture we're surrounded with. So from your church, or if you grow up in a Christian home, from that. And those are places that are helpful, but even a good church or a godly Christian home, it is an inadequate display of Christ for us. The we, we understand philosophically that the only place we can get an accurate understanding of our Lord is the Scriptures. And God's description of Himself here in this book and how that's united to Christ and how that changes everything. So this morning I want us to borrow help from the passage that Luke read from the writer, John, the disciple, you know that the Gospel of John is the, is the last of the Gospels to be written. There is some disagreement about the date about, uh, that John wrote, but most would agree, most scholars that um, are conservative would agree that it's toward the end of the first century, between 85 and 90 A.D. So if that's true, then what we have is we have the disciple that seem to have the most intimate relationship with the God-man. John's so very close to Jesus. Five decades since John has seen Christ on earth, takes up his pen, and by the guidance of the Spirit, John has contemplated the glories of Christ and the deeds of Christ and the words of Christ for 50 years. And John has seen the gospel spread throughout the Roman Empire and throughout Judaism and, and do what Christ said it would do. And John has also seen Christians lose everything that the world says you need to be happy and paid a terrible cost to follow Christ. And John, of course, has seen even within the church, the church betrayed by false teachers within, seduced by sin's lies. John would have seen many who though claiming to follow Christ, eventually turned their back upon him and proved that they were not of Christ. And what does John have to say about this Jesus at the end? I, I know it's wonderful to hear what people say about Christ when they first come to Christ, but I'm really interested to hear what John says at the end of the journey. And John picks up his pen, and particularly in verse 14 and then in verse 16. Listen to what John says about Christ. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And then in verse 16, for of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. John makes this statement, he thinks back on the Lord Jesus Christ, when I consider my Savior, I remember the glory of the only begotten Son of God, not a halo over his head, not even primarily thinking of the, of the transfiguration. John doesn't even record the transfiguration in his accounts, but I remember seeing there in Christ a fullness, a fullness of grace and truth, and it is a mediatorial fullness, that is, it is a fullness that was given to Christ on behalf of his people, and we have all received. John received from that fullness, and for the last 2,000 years, every believer that has read that passage has been able to say in some measure, and I have received of that same fullness. 
Now, because it, it, because it affects every single believer, you understand that the statement in verse 16 has a significant potential to change the way we live day to day. But how you are benefited by verse 16 will in great measure be determined by how you understand the word fullness. How full is the fullness that John saw in Christ? How full is the fullness that is available for the believer today? So I want us to look at one of God's attributes. Corey talked about the attributes uh, in our prayer time. I want us to look at the infinity of God, the fullness of God. And I want us to see just kind of a quick uh, overview of what the Bible says of that, how the Bible links that with the, with the God-man, and then some practical applications, how John applied that to people in his day. And I hope that it will help us begin to enlarge our views of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we look at any of those passages, we do need to think a little bit about uh, the attributes of God. Because it is easy, and I really appreciate the things Corey said this morning, because he, he really guarded us against a number of the pitfalls that it's so easy to fall into without realizing you can kind of humanize God you know, one of the things Corey mentioned was that you could think of a, a, the quality, goodness, and then kind of use it to define God, and so you've reversed things. When we think of the attributes of God, how do we, how do we be careful with those? An attribute is just one of the perfections of God's character. It's who He is. It's what He is. It's some quality of His divine nature, and He's revealed it to us. And when we think of the attributes, we, we don't want to humanize God. We understand that these are things that are solitary. He is, he is in a category all by himself. When we think of an attribute, we are thinking of something that is essentially true of God and not of something that God maintains. In other words, whatever attribute we're looking at, whether it's the attributes of God's greatness, the, the immensity of God, attributes like um, you know, self-existence, eternity, infinity, incomprehensibility, all power, all knowledge, all presence. When we think of those things, we're not thinking of things that God, if we could put it in everyday language, things that God wakes up every day and, and exerts effort to maintain. When we think of God's moral perfections, His goodness, so whether it's his righteousness and his purity, or it's his faithfulness and patience, his love, his compassion, his pity, his wrath, his justice. When we think of those qualities of God that we call the goodness of God, we're not thinking of qualities that God maintains. God doesn't have to say to himself, I need to exert uh, effort here to, to maintain patience or to maintain purity. These are things that are fundamentally true of God because of what God is. The simplest way I can think of it is to think of humanness and us. You could have woken up this morning and acted like a bit of a monster at home, and so someone could look at you and say, you're not a very nice human, or you might have woken up and been a very kind person this morning, and your family says, mom or dad, they're a very nice person, but no matter how you act, it is effortless for you to be human. Humanness comes effortlessly to us, and the attributes of God that we see in Scripture come effortlessly to Him. These are things that are fundamentally true of His essence. He is. When we talk about the attributes of God, we also have to remember that these are not different parts in God, and it, that, that's something I really struggle with because it's just easy when you read a book on the attributes of God, like by uh, the, the small book by an author named A.W. Pink or, or Tozer or a big book by a guy named Sharnock. When you read these books on the attributes of God, well, you know, there's an attribute per chapter. And I just timed, I, I fall into the trap of thinking that these are all the wonderful parts of God's being. But God has no parts. There is one great, beautiful river of perfection in our God. And we can discuss the attributes separately. So we can talk about love one week, and we can talk about wrath the next week. 
But these things don't exist separately. They are seamlessly woven together. Imagine a great river pouring down a channel, and it hits the shallows. And when it hits these rocks, this one great mighty river is divided into ten channels as it divides through the rocks, and then it comes back together again. And so as we study our Bible, it's as if we can see the great perfection of God uh, hit these rocks and it divides into these channels and we can discuss the individual streams, but really, they're all one. When we talk about the infinity of God, that means that every other attribute will be impacted by what you think of as infinity. If you learn about one aspect of God's character, one attribute, it greatly enhances every other attribute. So we learn that God is good, or God is patient, or God is faithful, or God is pure, or God is knowing, or God is present, and then we study the infinite fullness of God, and we go back to those attributes, and they're all enlarged. There is an infinite goodness, there's an infinite patience, an infinite wrath, an infinite purity, And when you study the the attributes of God's moral perfection, the the desirability of God that we talked about this morning, his moral perfections bring a beauty to those those aspects of his greatness. Yes, he's infinite and self-existing and eternal, but he's also pure and loving and righteous. When we study these aspects, we don't want to humanize God. All right, well, let's look at what the Scripture says a little bit about the infinity of God and then how John applies that. What, it, what do we mean when we say that God is infinite? That is, in His person, the perfections of God's character are in themselves essentially unlimitable. They're unlimited, unmeasured, unbounded, incalculable, incomprehensible. They cannot increase and they cannot diminish. So all that is true about God's character and nature, it is impossible to be measured, limited, increased, or diminished. None of God's perfections have ever been affected that way by anything in His creation. One of the qualities of God that we probably don't often think about is this, that God is the only one that knows God, really knows God, comprehends God. What does the Bible say about it? I want to give you just a few examples. We'll just look at some different qualities of God and how they're without measure. So think about the rights of God, the sovereignty of God, His his authority. God has divine rights, and the right of God to rule is like God Himself without limit. We understand authority to some degree, but every authority on earth has an appropriate boundary. And, you know, over the last two years, we have wasted a lot of breath and a lot of space on the internet and uh, killed a lot of trees talking about where the government should or shouldn't stop with its authority. We, we talk about governmental overreach. We get upset with when someone who is an authority abuses their authority. So we have governments, and they have a right to rule us in some ways, but then there are in other ways they don't. We have authorities at work, and we say, well, my boss has a right to tell me what to do Monday to Friday, but Saturday and Sunday they don't. We have authorities at school. We have authorities in our home. Our parents have authority over us. But there is no authority in creation that has an unlimited right to rule you. But God does. Every aspect of your being External behavior, internal motivations, Monday through Sunday, every relationship, every place you walk into, you go in there as a being under the unlimited and immeasurable authority of God. Listen to what Nebuchadnezzar said in Daniel 4. His dominion, God's dominion, is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? 
the authority of God unlimited. Think about this. The understanding of God unlimited, immeasurable. We study and reason and grow in knowledge. So think about a, a person maybe who is world famous for their brain, you know, the brain the size of a planet. And so they've worked very hard as students, and, you know, as they go into life and they become adults, they increase in knowledge, and then they kind of peak, and they're recognized as, you know, as the smartest expert in their field, and that goes on for a few moments. And then with age, they begin to diminish, and they begin to forget one of my favorite professors was a professor named Reginald Barnard, and he was uh, um, from Australia by way of London, and he still had this, you know, English accent, so he, he could have been a heretic, and I would have loved everything he said because he, he sounded like Oxford, England, uh, but he was a wonderful believer, and I met him my first year in seminary. He was in his 80s, and he was so uh, weak that he couldn't get to class on his own, so they would always ask each year, would one of the students be willing to help Dr. Barnard get his right medications, get him to the class on time, and I said, me, and I just asked him questions all up and down the hallway, and Dr. Barnard, what about this, and he would say, oh, dear boy, I need to go to the restroom, fine, and we, as we go in the restroom, I'd get him into the stall and say, now, Dr. Barnard, what about this, you know, I'm, I imagine he requested someone else the next year. Dr. Barnard, as he continued to age, I, I got out of seminary. I visited him again. He was in a nursing home, and Parkinson's disease had just overcome him. And as I was talking with him, he would say, oh, do you see that? And I would look, and he was hallucinating. His mind was gone. That's us, not God. God does not study. God does not reason through things and come to a better conclusion. God does not learn. God, in all of his perfections, is without limit. God's knowledge is without limit. He knows all things that are or could be, and he knows them without effort. God never has to remember something. God cannot forget. Think about the presence of God. Where does God show his presence. He is the one being who never travels, but is in every place at once. Solomon built the temple, and then he said this, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens, they cannot contain you, how much less this temple which I have built. We sing a hymn in the church where I pastor that has this line, thou art a sea, God's like a sea without a shoreline, a sun without a sphere. Think of the thoughts of God. They're without number. Psalm 40, verse 5. Your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. God's deeds are without number. Job 9, verse 10. He does great things past finding out. You, you can't figure them out. Yes, wonders without number. But one of the most significant passages when it comes to the infinite fullness of God and the believer is found in what Paul writes to the Colossians. So if you have your Bibles, jump over to Colossians. I want to point out a verse in chapter 1 and then two verses in chapter 2. Colossians 1 and verse 19. Paul is writing from prison. Paul, the man who has lost all for Christ, from the prison, writes to these Colossian Christians, and he speaks to them about Christ. And in chapter 1, after some of the sweetest and most sublime descriptions of Jesus that we find anywhere in the Bible, in verse 19, he says this, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. It is the Father's good pleasure, Paul says, for all the fullness of deity to be united to our humanity in the womb of Mary. For all that is true of the perfections of God to be somehow in a way that is far beyond our, our explanation to bring humanity and to unite it to that. So that there is in the womb of Mary a true human life 
but one that is also truly divine. And I love when Paul says it's the Father's pleasure. It's not just his sovereign will. That's just so sterile and, you know, it's just so harsh sounding. From eternity past, it has always been the pleasure, the delight of the triune God to unite the God the Son to our humanity so that he might become our kinsman, our redeemer. In chapter 2, he, he goes further, and it gets better. Verse 9 and verse 10. For in him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in him, you have been made complete. Now, if you write in your Bible, if you have a wide margin Bible, if you like to do that, this is one of those places that you ought to. There's a couple of really significant things about that passage. First, the little word bodily, in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Why does he say that and what does it mean? I think I agree with the scholars that say that Paul is trying to point out that there is a fullness of God in the God-man. It is not a symbolic fullness. We see in the scripture other times where God seems to draw near and it's as if God just invades you know, creation and time. And God shows himself there in a wonderful physical expression, but it is symbolic. There's the fullness of God in the Holy of Holies. And there's that amazing glow, the Shekinah glory of God. There's the fullness of God as he comes down on Mount Sinai. And all the earth, you know, rumbles under his majesty. And the skies are ablaze with him. And there's a cloud of glory. But those are merely symbolic compared to the true real, substantial union of humanity and deity in Christ. This is not a symbolic thing for our, you know, to teach us a lesson. God has actually united his fullness to our humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. Bodily, truly, not symbolically. Also, the words there in the New American Standard, it says in verse 10, it says, in him, uh, pardon, in him you have been made complete. Look back up at again, verse 9. In him all the fullness uh, of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. In the Greek, the word fullness and the word complete are the same basic word. In other words, our translators could have translated this passage saying this. In him all the fullness of God dwells bodily. And because of that, in him, Christian, you are full. Same word. Or, in him, the completeness of the deity dwells bodily, and in him, you are complete. It is an amazing gift to sinners that the clearest picture we can ever see of the infinite and boundless an immeasurable perfection of our Creator is given to us in our Rescuer. Now, I haven't said anything about the infinite fullness of God that you probably don't already know. I haven't said anything uh, that probably surprises you, and many of you could say much more. But what I want us to spend the rest of our time together doing is asking this question, but how do I live on that? I am not afraid that this is a church made up of people that deny the infinite fullness of God or that deny that the infinite fullness of God dwells in the God-man. But I am afraid that you, like me, wake up each day and live sometimes as if that's a fairy tale. I am haunted by the fact that I can talk one way about God on Sunday and within a few hours I go home and live as if, as if it's not real, as if God isn't infinitely full, as if I am not presented before God by this infinitely full Savior and, and able to draw upon the treasury of heaven. Why do I live? Why does John Snyder wake up and live as if he is as poor as he was before he came to Christ. How does a Christian live differently 
because of the infinity of God united to the humanity in Jesus Christ. A.W. Tozer talked about um, biblical truths that we agree to, but they're kind of like old, dusty objects back in some corner of the attic of our mind, some old closet. And he asked, how can they ever, you know, have the beauty and impact on us that they once did? And Tozer said, well, we just go get them out. We study them. You know, in a sense, you read the Bible as if for the first time. What does Paul say about this Christ? I mean, what if you had never heard about Christ before and you're hearing for the first time and you say, this man from prison says that all the fullness of deity is in this Savior and I am made full in him. And so we take those truths out and we dust them off and we study them and we risk everything to live on them. And they come alive to us again. I want to help us do that this morning by looking at how John does it. Let me give you three things. First, when we consider that the believer belongs to the infinitely full Savior, and that fullness is given to him to share with his people. One thing that that means is this. It means that the Christian is the only religious person in human history that has the privilege of belonging to a God that you can never fully understand and you can never fully explain. When your children ask you questions about God and you feel bad because you kind of, you know, you, you try and you reach a certain edge and you say, I... I know that what I told you is true, and I wish I knew better, but that's about as far as I can go. When a preacher preaches, and you feel like you're coming from an ocean of reality, and you try to bring truths to the people, and then you look in your hand, and there's just a little damp moisture left from the ocean, and you think, is that all I'm able to say? It is a glorious privilege to be a people who belong to a God that is so immense That no matter how much you and I study and how much we grow, and we can grow in our real understanding and our experiential knowledge of God, at the end of a life of study, we will be no closer to fully figuring God out than we were at the beginning. God is fundamentally incomprehensible. That is, while you can know Him, wonderfully know Him, You can never get your mind all the way around. You can never fully comprehend any single aspect of his character. Now, in John's letter, there is just a quick example I want to give you. In 1 John 3, in verse 1, you know the passage. John writes and says, See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. That's a fine translation. That's New American Standard. But I think there are better translations. Listen to the ESV. See what kind of love. So New American Standard says, see how great a love. ESV says, see what kind of love. New King James Version, behold what manner of love. The reason I think that the NAS isn't the best translation there is because it kind of misses the nuance of the original Greek word. In John's day. The Greek word meant something like this. It was something that was used by a person when they were shocked or baffled or confused. And they would say something like this. What kind of thing is that? Or what is is that? Or where does a thing like that come from? So if you read Greek literature from John's day, that's the way the word's used. So if you were to put 1 John 3, verse 1, in our modern language, it might sound something like this, where John says, oh, look, what a shockingly confusing kind of love God has shown to us. What a strange, what a rare delight God has shown. What a compassion that is so unique that we, we want to say, where does something like that come from? When he made us his children, every attribute of God, because it is infinite, is incomprehensible. 
God has revealed himself in a way that we can know him. God has revealed himself in a way that everything we need for faith and life is provided. God has told us things about himself that are accurate and true, but God has not told you the complete tale. A Puritan, John Howe, nearly 400 years ago, this is what he said about the incomprehensibility of God. He said this, God has, in this book, in the, in the scriptures, given us a true report of himself, but not a full one. A report such as will guard us from error, but not from ignorance. We can apply our minds to contemplate the attributes whereby the blessed God reveals to us his being, though we will still have but a low and defective conception of every one of them. That is not the way we normally talk. We don't introduce, you know, Bible professors from seminary and say, uh, Brother so-and-so or Dr. so-and-so, and he just wrote a book on the attributes of God, and you ought to read it because he has a wonderfully defective and inadequate view of every one of those. But he does. If every theologian from the last 2,000 years was gathered into a room with us, and the, and the angels that have most intimate contact with God joined us, and for the rest of our life, we were locked in this building studying one of his attributes. At the end of the youngest person's life in this room that outlived the rest of us, if they were to take and present before God this great book of all that we learned, there would still be more that we did not know than we did know. Let me give you two examples in Scripture. First, Habakkuk chapter 3. Turn with me, if you will, to Habakkuk chapter 3. In this little book, you know that Habakkuk is pretty bothered by what God is doing. First, Habakkuk looks around at the Jews, and they are so godless that Habakkuk cries out to God and says, in a sense, aren't you paying attention? Don't you care? I mean, are you the same God that I read about in the other, from the other prophets and in the days of Moses? Your people are so wicked. And God's answer to Habakkuk's cry is, I am going to deal with this. I am raising up the Babylonians, and I will use them to judge my people. Then Habakkuk has a second complaint, a second moral problem. God, how can you use the wicked Babylonians to punish your people? They're more wicked than us. And in chapter 3, a lot of the answers kind of come together. In chapter 3, Habakkuk's prayer, we find that Habakkuk has this sight of God, this vision of God coming to rescue his people, and it is going to be glorious. And he quotes in verse 3 from Deuteronomy chapter 33, where Moses describes God coming to rescue them from Egypt using this poetic language of the mountains in the region being lit up with light as God in glory comes and saves them. So that's what verse 3 is talking about. He's just saying, like the glorious way God came and rescued us from Egypt under Moses, when he rescues us from Babylon, it'll be a spiritually glorious thing. Look at verse 4. His radiance, when God comes, his radiance is like the sunlight. He has rays flashing from his hand. There is the hiding of his power. Do you not find that a bit of a strange verse? Do you think that maybe the preacher will say, well, actually, in the original language, it doesn't mean anything like that. But actually, in the original language, it's just like that. When God comes to rescue, and it's painted in this poetic language of God, it's like a sunrise. It's like lightning flashing from God. It's like the sky is ablaze with his glory. And the mountains that are mentioned there are lit up with the light. There, when God really stretches out his arm and acts, Habakkuk says, there you really see the hiding of God's power. Why doesn't he see it, say, there you, you really see the power of God? Matthew Henry, his explanation is this. The operations of God's power compared with what he could have done are rather a hiding of it than a discovery of it. In other words, do the math. If God is infinite, wherever we see him act, 
we see something of God's character being displayed. But no, how, no matter how wonderfully it's displayed, because it is an infinite quality in God, more is hidden than revealed. Are you afraid, Christian, that when you read the things that are said about Christ, that the writers of the Bible are using hyperbole, that they're using exaggeration to kind of prop up your morale, to get you through the day? Every description of God, every description of the God-man in his perfection is an understatement. It is a statement made for little children so that we can get some grasp. That brings us to another passage, Job chapter 26. Job talks about these great things God does in creation, and then in verse 14 he says this, Behold, these, these great things that God does, these are the fringes of his ways, and how faint a word we hear of him, or how faint a whisper. So Job says, when we see God do shocking things, what we're seeing is the edge of God's activity, or we're hearing a whispered word of a conversation. So think of it this way. When a dad comes home from work and uh, he and his wife have an infant, and so the, this is, you know, before the infant crawls. So all the baby can do is lay in the middle of the floor. And so dad comes home, he walks by the infant, and uh, the infant sees the bottom couple of inches of dad's pant leg, the the him of his pant leg go past. And we'll say that the infant knows, ah, oh, that's dad. That's the way he sounds. This is the time he comes home every day. That's his pant leg. If, if the infant could talk and you could say to him, can you explain to me everything there is to know about your dad? How much could he tell you? Yeah, he's got a couple pair of shoes. He's got a couple pair of pants. They look like this. When we pour out our lives and stretch our intellect to understand something of the perfection that God has revealed to us at the end of our life, you and I don't know any more than the infant that sees the edge of a pant leg or the whisper of a conversation. If you come into a room like this and uh, people are all sitting down and before church starts, uh, they're talking to each other kind of quietly and you can't help but hear a little bit of what is said. So there's a conversation going on for four or five minutes, and you hear two words. If someone were to pull you aside afterward and say, tell me what they were talking about. How much do you know? Well, you say, I only heard two words of a long conversation. When we get to know God through what he reveals to us in Scripture, it is perfectly suited to our needs but it is only a couple of words of a long conversation. It is so helpfully humbling to the Christian to realize that no matter how far you go in the study of God, there is more hidden than has been revealed. Paul warns the Corinthians that as knowledge grows, so does pride. We get puffed up. And I find it a great help as we look at God, to realize that at the end of our lives, we have not figured him out. Spurgeon said this, there is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of God. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity and all our pride is drowned in its infinity. I think if you could kind of say it in a simple way, I feel that when I read a big book about God, I think I'm out in the middle of the ocean, you know, in the deep end, and I'm really pretty impressed with myself until I look around and I realize I, I'm in the little kiddie pool still, and I thought I had figured it out. So one way that John applies the infinite fullness of God in Christ is this. When he goes to describe it, he finds it's incomprehensible. Let me give you another. Belonging to an infinitely full Savior means that when we come to Him to deal with the issue of the stain of your sin, my sin, there is complete cleansing. Have you ever considered that there is an unbreakable connection between the assurance 
that a Christian has to come before the eyes of a holy God and the understanding the Christian has of the infinite fullness of God and the Redeemer, your stain is so deep it reaches every area of your person. Your offense is offense against God is so high it can't be measured. Every area of life we failed and the fullness of Christ guarantees that when He becomes the propitiation, when He becomes the sacrifice, when the Father unleashes an infinite wrath on the infinite God-man, the payment is so complete that every helpless sinner that casts their life upon Him and in a sense says, all that I know of myself, I give to him. And all that I read of Christ, I grab hold of by faith. That every believer is cleansed, really cleansed and forgiven of all sin. So much so that it is impossible for God to look upon you and to condemn you again. It is impossible for the law of God to come and to cry out against you again. You can never again be separated from the delight and the favor, the grace of God. We measure the confidence that God still loves us after we sin by all the wrong measurements. How do you measure that? I mean, do you ever show up at church on Sunday and think, the way I've lived this week, I don't think God even wants to see my face. I feel that way. We have a prayer meeting before our main preaching service, like yours. But I have a pulpit that's an old-style pulpit, and it's kind of a big wraparound pulpit. And so I just sit down in it. Nobody can see me during the prayer meeting. And I, oftentimes, I just say to God, I quit, I quit. God, my heart is so easily led astray. My doubts are so easily believed. I am cold when you are infinitely attractive. How can I even be a Christian? What confidence do I have that I'm not cast out of God's family? Sometimes we fashion a confidence based on the size of the sin in our mind. We say, well, I know I sinned, but I mean, come on, it wasn't a big sin. Or I know I sinned, but I mean, I didn't really mean to. And so we have all these wrong measurements. Go back to the scriptures. All the fullness of God is in him. And John says, and from that fullness, you and I have all received. And then he uses a strange phrase in John chapter 1, grace upon grace. It's kind of hard to translate. If you read the scholars, there's a, quite a, a, a wide variety of translations. But really, they all say the same thing. So there's the idea of grace in the place of grace. Old grace replaced by new grace. And, you know, in a very human way of thinking, God's friendship has been shown toward you all day long. And by the end of the day, you think, I wonder if God's friendship's getting a little tired of hanging out with me. And you wake up the next morning and the favor, the undeserved favor, the grace of God meets you again before your feet hit the floor. And it's like the very first meeting. It's not tired of you. New mercies every morning. Grace in the place of grace. Grace on the heels of grace. Like sitting at an ocean, uh, beside you know, the ocean, and you're on the shore, and wave replaces wave, replaces wave. John compares Christ to Moses in that verse, in, ver in the verse 17 that follows. All of us have received from the fullness of Christ. And he says, because Moses, he gave us the law, but through Christ, grace and truth were realized, were really experienced. Why does he compare Jesus and Moses? He's not comparing them as individuals. He's comparing their ministries, the impact of their service in the great economy of redemption. Moses had a, had a glorious role to play, but it's nothing compared with your Savior. Moses brings you the law, and in the law you see what's right and wrong, and all the fog is lifted. And in the law you see some reflection of the moral straightness and rightness of our God. What's right, what's pure, what's good. And the law, you know, comes in like an MRI. It examines us. It doesn't heal us. I mean, nobody gets an MRI to be fixed. We get an MRI to see what's wrong. And the law is like an MRI, and it shines into the internal, you know, crevices of your soul where you don't want anybody to see. And you think, I thought I wasn't that bad until the law of God came. Paul said the law of God came and it killed me. 
It just killed my good impression of myself. The law searches us, Paul says in Romans 7. It's like a light. It aggravates us. It makes us angry. We think, I have a right to do what I want to do. We get worse, and the law condemns us. And that's what Moses brought you. But Christ, grace upon grace, unexpected friendship from the king that I fought against. His perfect obedience, his sacrificial death, his wonderful resurrection, his ruling now over all, all the fullness of God in that humanity, and all that humanity and fullness of God turned toward the sinner in mercy. There is a complete cleansing. John talks about it again in John's first letter, chapter 1. You know the verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I used to be so terrified that there was some aspect of sin that I hadn't yet confessed. I think, but what, what, if, I'd, what if I forgot? And you know, there's no peace with God if I leave one of them undone. In chapter 2, John says that I'm writing these things to you so you don't sin, so you don't go on living for yourself. What an empty thing. But if you do sin, we have an advocate. You have a defense attorney. It's Christ, your propitiation, your sacrifice. And if he argues your case, we could say there is no fear that the judge will be against you. When we have Christ, we have everything we need for the fullest, most perfect, and complete forgiveness. I'm going to give you one more. The infinite fullness of God in Christ means that we have a, a satisfying answer to questions that bother most of us, whether you're a Christian or not. Here's what it sounds like for a Christian. I know that Christ is great and admirable, and I'm, I'm thankful for what he's done, but I'm afraid he's not enough for what's coming next, whatever it is in your life. Is he enough? For the lost person, so for you that are here, and while you would say many good things about Christ, you would have to be honest and say, I am standing at what I feel is a safe distance from Christ. I am stiff-arming the truth. And your question is, is he, is he worth it? Amy Carmichael, missionary to India, many of you have read her books, when overwhelmed with the sight of sin in India, the child trafficking in the temple system, a land saturated with millions of idols through the Hindu system, offered temples that were big and impressive, and then she looks at the missionary efforts in her day, and so much of that was small and weak, and some of it was compromised. On the edge of despair, she goes and she gets some time away. She takes a break and she goes to the seaside and she's sitting there on the shore and she's praying, God, are you enough for India? Are you enough for our labors? And she sees the ocean waves come in and there's a shell turned upside down. And so the wave rolls over the shell and then the wave recedes. And of course, the shell is full overflowingly full. And the next wave does it again and again. And she felt like it was such a clear picture. God, infinite God, will always be overflowingly more than any of us can need. When there are things in the church that break your heart, when there are things in our world that break your heart, when you wake up and look in the mirror and you see things in you, Christian, that break your heart. And you are tempted to despair. And the question is whispered in your mind by the enemy. And you are so ready to join the question, is he enough or has he lied? And we go back to the scripture and we see what John says. There is an infinite fullness in God. When John writes to the Christians in his day, 1 John chapter 1, John's writing to people, and he knows by experience that if they embrace the things he says, they get Christ. But they lose all the rest. 
They will lose friends. They will lose family, jobs, possessions. Some of them will lose their lives. It's been happening all across the Roman Empire. The Jews are hunting them. The Romans are beginning to hunt them. So John's writing a letter to a group of people, and he's saying, I want to tell you, you can have Christ. Of course, you're going to lose everything. You've seen it happen to other people. Why doesn't John write a letter that's a bit apologetic? Like, look, I know it's going to be rough, but I got to tell you this. You know, Jesus is, here's Jesus. Brace yourself. It's going to be kind of hard. Why does John write them and there's no apology? There's, there's no embarrassment. Why is it as if John is writing them about something that is only pleasantness? Listen to what he says. This is all he offers them. He says in 1 John 1 verse 3, What we have seen and heard of Christ, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. John's joy and theirs joy. I find it so thrilling as a pastor to know what John knew, that when we offer someone the infinite Christ, even if they lose everything, but they gain Christ, what they gain is so much better that what they lose is not worth mentioning. John only offers them one thing. I'm telling you, we held Christ. We heard Christ. We saw Christ. He was the life of God come to earth. And I'm writing these things to you so you can have fellowship, so you can have a relationship with this Christ, and that will make your joy complete. That's all he offers them. Is he enough? Yes, he's infinite. Is he worth it? What if you have not yet decided that Christ would be your king? And so you say, well, I think I believe these things. Um, I'm just not ready. What if your problem is you have the wrong measure of Christ? You still think of him the way the culture talks about him. I mean, you know he's good, and it would be noble to follow him, but it's, you, you know, it's the picture in your mind is, well, you give up everything, and you have this shriveled, dried-up little life, but, but you're a good person. If you could get the right measure of Christ in your mind, your problem will not be asking yourself, ah, is he worth it? Your problem, your struggle will become a different struggle, a struggle that every person who's a Christian here has had at times, and the struggle is this. Why would an infinite God call me? Why would he let me come to him? Why would he, be, why would he bring me near the Father in peace why does God know that I even exist? Why does he forgive me? Why does he love me? That's the struggle. When lost people join churches and talk religious on Sundays, they have a struggle. How do I put religious words together in a right way to make me appear as one who really loves him? When a Christian who has tasted the kindness of God, comes to church and says things about Jesus Christ, they have a struggle. How can I find words that are in any way appropriate for this king? When John said that all the fullness of the deity, uh, that the fullness, Paul said all the fullness of deity in Christ, John said, and of his fullness we have all received, my challenge to all of us would be this. Can we wake up tomorrow morning and ask the Lord, teach me again what it means that the infinite God is united to our humanity and don't leave me alone until I gladly say, I gladly call nothing mine but him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words that John gives. We thank you for the words that Paul writes from prison. We thank you that these are not exaggerations. We thank you for 2,000 years of evidence. But Lord, for our souls today, help us to go to the closet of our mind and to dust off the doctrine of the infinite God 
and to live on it. Show us yourself again, and then show the world yourself through our transformed lives. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen.